Hello and welcome to the event, Money Hub Live, stable coins and why they matter to everyone in crypto. I'm your host, Doug Shepard, and today with me, I have commercial officer, Paul Quickenden, and commercial manager, Patrick Elway, two of the key people behind the launch of New Zealand's newest stable coin to hit crypto, NZDD. I'll pop them on your screen right now. Hey, hey. All right, awesome. Thanks for joining us, guys. Now, I'm extremely excited for this event, not only because it's about a topic that I'm personally very interested in, but also because we have two brand new faces that we've never seen in these webinars before. So before we jump in, I'll hand it over to you guys for a quick introduction. So Paul, uh, you are the commercial officer. What does that mean in terms of this space? Uh, so for Easy Crypto, I look after all the revenue generating aspects of the business. So um, the New Zealand business, the Australian business, the South African business, which are Easy Crypto, and also the stablecoin business. So um, and just kind of work with the rest of the business to make sure that we get uh, the targets that we're after. Fantastic. And with so many demographics and, and regions that you're after, you're going to be traveling a lot. And actually, for those watching, Paul literally just got off the plane uh, <laughs> five minutes ago so that he could join us. So thank you so much for, for making the time to join us today and explain uh, everything that you're about to uh, in conjunction with Patrick, who was telling me earlier that he's in charge of managing this project. So what have you been doing in the space recently? Yeah, so hey, I'm um, Patrick. I'm a commercial manager at EC. So I work with Paul on yeah commercial stuff, uh, but also part of my remit is yeah, special projects, stuff like NZDD, where we're looking into new and exciting things we can kind of do in the space, figuring out the technicals of like how things would work. Is it actually going to be viable for us to spin it up? And then also I handle a lot of our data work and our data systems to yeah make sure everyone has an informed view of uh, what we're looking at and what we're doing. Fantastic. Well, sounds like we've got the dream team to walk us through NZDD, Stablecoin, and a bunch of other terms that some people might not have ever heard before. So with that, uh, I will allow Patrick to have a look at these slides and he'll walk you through a presentation with Paul with about 25, 30 minutes. Uh, and I'll pop a link in the chat where you can ask any questions that you might have during this presentation. And then I'll come back and I'll facilitate some Q&A for about 30 minutes uh, with the two gentlemen on screen. Uh, and with that, I'll let you guys uh, run it off. Awesome, awesome. Let's jump into it. Uh, hey all, uh, yeah, it's a pleasure to be doing this for Money Hop, and we hope this you learn a little bit about what we're doing at EC and um, how yeah, stable coins are such a key part of this emerging ecosystem. Uh, yeah. So today, what we're going to be talking about? Well, what are stable coins? How do you create them? There is kind of a bit of a nebulous term. So going into a little bit of just the finer details about what they are, how they work. Then, yeah, doing a bit of a general introduction. Uh, we're looking into the history of NZDD, specifically the stablecoin that we've spun up, about the use cases for it, how the launch kind of went with it. And then for the last little bit, we're going to be talking about well, where to next now that we've done this, what opportunities has this unlocked? Uh, finally, completing with a bit of a Q&A. So, PQ, what are stablecoins? Great question. So stable coins are price stable cryptocurrencies. Um, and generally they're designed to give people a in trading a, a safe haven asset to move into and out of when they're trading, because um, crypto can be quite volatile. Uh, but they're also have taken on a life of their own and, and have got um, incredibly good product market fit and end up being used for payments and a whole bunch of other use cases, which we'll talk about. Um, so at the market, there are at the moment, sorry, there are um, two predominant forms of stable coins. One is asset base bait. So sitting behind it is gold or oil. Um, they're, they're the two most, most common assets. And the stable coin actually gives you redemption rights to the actual underlying asset. So if you buy a uh, Paxos gold token, uh, you actually have rights to the gold, um, to the value of your stable coin. And then the most common one, the most successful one at the moment is uh, dollar backed or fiat backed stable coins. And that is one for one dollar backed in a bank account or in government bonds. And uh, as, a, as a holder of that stable coin, if you are uh, under contract with the issuer, you have redemption rights one for one for that for that um, that particular asset. And the issuer of the stable coin makes its money by putting um, money in the bank and all the assets under management. And that's how they work. Go to the next slide now, Patrick. What? Yeah. So. 
Next slide. What particular niche were stablecoins kind of developed to kind of solve? Why were stablecoins invented? Well, they came about originally because of frustration with the banking system. Um, getting money into and out of the crypto ecosystem was was quite a um, extravagant process. I'll use that term, and it took introduced some fairly long delays. And so they were originally uh, invented to get around that. And so traders didn't have to do that so often, and neither did the exchanges, which were um, which were battling for banking access and that sort of stuff. And then they kind of like i said they got a life of their own they were adopted really uh, quickly by the user population and they wanted a dollar back like like product but they didn't want to have to move it in and out of their bank account and so they could keep it in the crypto ecosystem and that has a lot less friction in terms of how uh, it, it can be used and when it can be used you know, essentially you're holding a dollar that can be traded at any one time any time in the world 24 7. and then um and then they've evolved again and, and they're kind of being used as a platform for a whole bunch of uh, use cases kind of in the fintech space so payments and remittances are, are one one key use case people are, um, in certain uh, parts of the crypto ecosystem are using them for lending and interest-bearing instruments creating yield um, and and uh, leverage uh, and then there's also this phenomenon of programmable money so having um, an automated escrow, which is a smart contract that says, if you deliver me the goods, I'll release the money, that sort of stuff. And so they've really um, grown exponentially. I think the, the total market cap now is somewhere north of $90 billion of, of um, stable coins and largely dominated by two large American stable coins, but uh, the non-US dollar stable coin market is growing quite rapidly as well. Yeah. So for something that's worth $90 billion, right? That, that truly raises the question, well, how do they actually kind of work? Like these benefits, the reasons why they exist all really make sense, but what is the underlying kind of processes and flows behind it? What actually makes a stable coin stable? <laughs> so um, the structuring of them is remarkably similar to how the banking sector works because you've got a central bank or a bank in the background You've got a retail bank or the stable coin issuer, and then you've got the secondary market, which is where all the payments and all that sort of stuff happens. And so the way it works is in our in our example, Easy Crypto will take in retail deposits of New Zealand dollars. We will aggregate those up and then we will go to the issuing company, which is a, a different company from uh, Easy Crypto, uh, deposit the New Zealand dollars. If they put in 100,000 New Zealand dollars, we will mint 100,000 stable coins and we will send those to Easy Crypto and then they can use it for in their base or their traders or, or in sometimes their institutional forex flows and that sort of stuff. Similarly, if you want to burn or take those uh, stable coins out of supply and get um, fiat back, uh, you can send those stable coins to the issuing company. They will then burn them. So 100,000 get taken out of supply and you get issued with 100,000 New Zealand dollars into your bank account. Um, and and in, any, in any one time, what's in the, the bank account and what's on chain or, um, or visible on the blockchain should be uh, equal. That's the whole point of them. Yeah, yeah. So essentially, there's a separate issuing company there to trust that essentially holds these assets one for one. So there's a very clear separation of church and state between the the actual financially incentivized party and the party that's actually holding the assets, making sure things check out. And so yeah, while we're both from Easy Crypto, uh, NZDD, our stable coin is yeah, a completely separate entity from Easy Crypto. Easy Crypto does not have any overt control over it and it, they're purely a partnership relationship. All the funds are held in Great. trust really to make sure that the underlying asset that these currencies trade on isn't necessarily the fiat, while obviously it is, but it's trust, right? People are only going to use these and value these at one to one if it's trusted. And that's why the structures behind the scenes, understanding what is backing these tokens is so, so important. Yeah, and, and other stable coins uh, have a mixture of cash and government bonds or US treasuries uh, in, the, in the US um example uh the the key thing is they need to be liquid and, and and have value and so that's why those those two assets are the most predominant at the moment cool so how are they being used uh so like i said they're a, they're kind of a, a safe haven asset when crypto gets a bit volatile so they're a store of value and you know they're they're at face value the same as the underlying dollar that's in the account um 
in the bank account and so they they give you this this um representation of of your holdings or your crypto wealth um they're also a means of exchange so we're seeing businesses that are paying their vendors overseas using stable coins that's a very common use case and um you know we shouldn't forget that in new zealand we've got a very good banking system but in other parts of the world that's not the case and so stable coins are being used for remittances and gifting um you know sending sending money home to friends and family that sort of stuff that is a, a common one um patrick uh, you you work for easy crypto in new zealand but you're based in australia and so you know there's there's also there's also a payroll uh, function that, that exists in stable coins um as much as patrick would like to be paid in uh, in other other cryptocurrencies a stable coin probably makes the best sense for him oh, uh, considering yeah. he's a young man with a mortgage and, and bills to pay and that sort of stuff um we also have um a freelance economy now so what i mean by that there's a bunch of people in new zealand who uh, are you know digital nomads effectively and based anywhere in the world but have bills to pay or are, um or based in new zealand and they are being paid overseas um by an overseas company and so they're they're bringing money back and paying um, paying themselves uh, using stable coins um, and then the final one is kind of person to person payments so imagine you go out for dinner and you want to split the bill and I just send you you know half half the dinner bill in, in a stable coin and that's a that's a growing use case and that's quite similar to um, DOSH when they first came out in the New Zealand market um, and then the finally globally we're not seeing it in New Zealand but globally we're seeing some really interesting novel use cases so there are people who are kind of game gamifying exercise so if you take a you know your ten thousand steps which we're all told to, to be healthy you might get um you might get rewarded in a stable coin or, or some other crypto and that's another way that it's happening and like i said um smart contracts particularly in international trade uh, make a lot of sense where you've got bills of lading um, and you know really costly and laborious um bureaucratic processes which smart contracts can deal with really efficiently and so um as a vendor you know your trust is in an institution or a person that's in the software so you know once once you have the bill of lading and you've seen the goods you can release the funds and everyone gets paid and they're happy with that as a, as a mode of operating and i guess that's what's really interesting about this question about how stable coins are being used or what are the specific use cases right that stable coins are essentially trying to represent the currency that you have in your pocket but on the blockchain and thus anything you use money for you could do it with a stable coin, right? The use cases are as broad as people's imaginations, which kind of raises the question, given that we've already got this really good product to facilitate this cash, your bank accounts, why specifically are people using stable coins on chain versus those traditional systems? Yeah, so look, some, some there's varied use cases. So if you're an institution, so, you know, we are a business that moves a lot of uh, currency internationally um, and having a currency that settles in seconds and costs us like you know, a fraction of a cent to send anywhere in the world, regardless of the value, that's quite an attractive proposition for us. Otherwise, if you're in um, what we would think of as, as more traditional finance, you could be on a T plus two kind of settlement regime. So if you if you're moving money backwards and forwards between them, America and New Zealand, for instance, there's a large capital um, uh, tie up in that, in that, and that has a, co uh, a cost impact on the business. Um, people also want their funds instantly. Um, not, you know, we're not built for waiting uh, for banks to open, and we're not built for um, waiting over the weekend for funds to arrive. And so, um, stable coins have a, a role to play in, in that space. They work 24/7, just like blockchains do. And then, like I said, in trading, they're, they're very efficient. Like if you're holding um, one position in stablecoin and you want to get to, say, Bitcoin or Ethereum, rather than wait two to four hours for the funds to clear out of your bank account and settle in an exchange or a broker like Easy Crypto, then you know you can trade or swap straight away. And so that instantaneousness of them uh, allows you to you know enter the market or leave the market exactly when you want to. Um, like I said, costs are a really important part of it. it blockchains work. Um, there is a, an underlying fee to, to power the, the network. We call that gas, and it's a little bit like petrol in your car. Um, but it, it, the, the fee is kind of flat. It's variable, but it's kind of flat regardless of the volume. So there's no percentage cut. 
So if you could send a hundred dollars for one cent, you can send a hundred million dollars for one cent, and so that's a very um, uh, attractive proposition for people who are moving money money around the world constantly. Um, then you know this one came out of the crypto Web three thing. Like banks aren't always um, open to to doing business with certain Web three companies, uh, and sometimes you can't get an account. But also sometimes your bank can't get money to a, another party just because they don't have a corresponding banking partner in, in, in that part of the world or something like that. And so um, that can be uh, problematic, obviously, if you've got bills to pay, but also, um, you know, really deter and, and stunt business growth. And so having an asset that can move freely, you know, as, as freely as the internet is, is quite attractive to some people and some parties. And then, like I said, there's a timing aspect to it. Like we, we're a business that runs 24 seven. We're constantly sending money um, internationally and back. Uh, and so having something that works 24 uh, seven, we can, we can um, lay our hands on other assets over the weekends, which is you know, when we're just using banking as it can be quite a problem for us sometimes. And, you know, we can also pay people when, when and where we want to. And so that, that's quite an attractive proposition. And we've seen our, our, a number of customers using it that way as well. And I think one of the really interesting aspects with stable coins is all of these effects kind of apply across any currency, right? Like whether it is US dollars or euros or pounds or New Zealand dollars, all of these things kind of the same rules apply to them. Any stable coin that's on the Ethereum blockchain has all of the same parameters. None of these janky country or region based systems that you kind of have to navigate to move money. That was actually one of the big yeah. problems we saw in the space is that the market's traditionally been dominated by US-backed stable coins. And while stable coins are great, there's still a Forex risk there. Yeah, and we shouldn't discount that. I think um, in 2021, the, the difference between the US dollar and the New Zealand dollar moved to something like 23% in a year. And that's significant if you're uh, a trader. In that instance, it was a gain, but you know, coming up, will it will it continue as a question? And then, you know, unfortunately, the tax rules as they apply to crypto means that if you move from a volatile asset, so Bitcoin, into a US stablecoin, that's one trade, and you need to capture it and do the tax on that. But then, when you move from the US stablecoin into New Zealand dollars, that's also a trade, and so it's not particularly efficient in terms of tax and and. It doesn't help you when you're calculating value as well with all your bills and everything are in New Zealand dollars. So, um, so obviating the um, the forex risk from people's lives was a big was a big part of it, um, and also allows people to trade in the natural currencies. So, you know, unfortunately for me, I spend most of my time looking at the US chart. So I know that Bitcoin's sort of sixty eight thousand, but you know, it's hundred and something thousand New Zealand dollars. But you know, so. If you're if you having to make those adjustments, it's it's a bit of a mental um, gymnastics for some people. Um, in the crypto ecosystem, like there is no native New Zealand dollar pairs, so everything that we buy and sell in the New Zealand market has to get converted into a US um, currency anyway. From a, from our point of view, and it's not that easy to do. Like that's kind of why um, Easy Crypto is what it is, because that's that's our special source. And so getting access to um, US stable coins can actually be a, a real problem for big traditional players. Um, for the retail players, the secondary market is sorting that out, but it's, it's not always that efficiency. And then you've got sovereignty risks. And what I mean by that is, um, you know, with the slow um, uh, encroachment of US currency into our ways of thinking and doing is, you know, is that something you want to do? When you look at how the European Union's working, you know, moving to a single currency, we saw in moments of stress that not having currency control uh, the way that other nations do means that sometimes you are beholden to the, the whole and not the your specific needs and it might not always be the best thing for your economy and you know if you can recall look, the riots that were in Greece when they had to go through austerity when they probably preferred a different path that's a, a really good example of losing sovereignty control of your currency and that's why a whole bunch of um, central banks are looking at central bank digital currencies because they can see the efficiencies that you know blockchains or and or programmatic money i'll use that term um can bring but they also want to retain the control as the issuing entity uh, you know of, of record effectively so that's 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 part of the journey too yeah and all of these issues were issues so easy crypto primarily is a forex business we trade new zealand dollars into us dollars 
all of the issues on the screens are things that Easy Crypto was facing on a daily basis. There were costs to doing business. And that was kind of the journey about why we built NZDD, is we were actually looking for a solution to solve an internal problem. And then we kind of came to the conclusion, though, that, well, if this is a problem for us, it must be a problem for everyone, right? And if this solves our capital requirements because we can move things more quickly, if this solves our access requirements because we can get it to wherever we need, whenever we need, then other people probably have that issue, right? So we were really, really interested to see that there was no real major coins, no real major uh, New Zealand stable coins. New Zealand's a really large country, financially speaking. And yet this was an area that we were quite underrepresented in. So we saw this as an opportunity to bring something to market that would benefit EC primarily actually through our trading business, not necessarily through financial incentives, but actually just through the incentivization of our current business. But it's also something that we could give back to the New Zealand community. Uh, it's something that a lot of businesses, a lot of our partners that do struggle with banking access or do struggle to move money internationally can use uh, to speed up their flows. And it kind of did leave a question in our uh, minds is, well, if this is so straightforward, if it's such an obvious thing that we just need in this Web3 space, why has this not happened before? And that's a really, really easy question to ask before you build one of these things, especially because everyone thinks the building of it's going to be the most difficult thing. But the building of it really is the simple, cheapest, most straightforward part of it. These things by design are intentionally actually kept really, really simple. They're intentionally built in a way that um, people can understand, that people can just look at it, even if you're not super technical, even if you're not um, a programmer or a developer, you can understand what's happening here because they really need people to be trusted. So yeah, the development of it probably took, the actual technical development of it um, really took only about, I think it was a month full. Um, correct me if I'm wrong there. Um, and yeah, um, it's kind of this, this process that we kind of had to go through that takes a surprisingly long time. Also, you've got to see what works. There's been a lot of stable coins out there that haven't worked. There's been a lot of pitfalls and before signing out anything, you should look to see what people have done before you. And that was a huge amount of time to see, to understand the nuances. There's a surprising amount of history and experience in this space. Going back so far as to look at like deeds and shares where they are, the tokenization of other things to facilitate trading, right up until more exa uh, recent examples, stuff like Terra Luna and about what things to avoid in that space. The next one, and this, Oh, it, it's a tie between step two and three, but this one arguably took the longest was speaking with lawyers, speaking with regulators, constructing this in a way that did really fall back on that underlying idea, that concept of trust. Um, working with the regulators to make sure that it was something they were comfortable with, that it sat within their risk tolerance. We didn't want to take the Uber approach. We don't think it was beneficial to do something and then ask for forgiveness. We wanted to make sure that we were doing this right from day one. And the second point of that was, yeah, working with lawyers, structuring this in the right way so that there aren't pitfalls for our customers. There aren't um, janky bits of uh, legislation that we're kind of having to kind of shoot on our way around. It's built right. It's built solid from day one. Once we've had all that, we haven't even looked at a bank account. That's the next one, right? Is because half of the project, you've got the coins on chain and you've got the cash in the bank account. The other half of it is as important as picking a blockchain to build it on or blockchains is you need the bank. You need a bank that you can trust, that you can work with, that can be a strategic partner because part of that trust aspect is trusting that those funds are safe in that bank account and that falls back on the bank you pick. And banks then also have questions about it. They don't want you to be trying to put them out of business. They don't want you to be um, talking badly about them, but then also needing to use their services. So it's about working out a relationship, something that both sides really win in it. And that's actually not as easy as it sounds. Once we have a bank account, a lawyer, 
we've engaged with the regulators, we actually have a structure. Only then do we actually get to start looking at like use cases, distribution. What will this actually look like once it's out there, once it's in the market? And that was a really interesting thing because it's such a spectrum. Like when we talk about cash, right? Cash can be used for anything. But we're a small team. There's been a handful of people working on NZDD. We can't do everything. So the idea about who we target, how we target it, who will be the most receptive to it, is also a really, really interesting problem that we had to solve because we couldn't do anything. Um, but it also kind of falls back is that our, our constraints really do lead to imaginative and innovative solutions. And I think that's kind of what's happened here with how we've targeted it really looked at Forex businesses. Um, and then, yeah, we need to work with those partners, make sure we have those use cases, make sure we have those partnerships for day one. Um, and then, yeah, make sure it's easy to integrate with. This step six, this is actually the building bit of it. It's just building something simple that works with everything. And then, yeah, once we've built it, once we've got the bank accounts, once we're, what, 12 or 18 months down this track, then we can start talking about it. Then we can start marketing it then we can actually get it out there to people. So why did we build it? And I did touch on this a little bit beforehand, but the big one was this was useful to Easy Crypto. Easy Crypto's primary business model is enabling New Zealand citizens with their New Zealand dollars to access international sources of liquidity at reasonable prices. Before Easy Crypto came along, genuinely there was a 10 to 20% markup on buying stuff like Bitcoin with New Zealand dollars. It's not because there wasn't access, but it's because within New Zealand, you wanted to buy Bitcoin at 2 p.m. on a Saturday afternoon. Well, you've really struggled to find a buyer to buy the exact same amount at the price you wanted at that time within New Zealand. So Easy Crypto, provides access to a world full of partners. That's really the service Easy Crypto provides. And that involves moving large amounts of money on and offshore. That, for anyone who's worked in the Forex space, is not as simple as it sounds. It's an exceptionally difficult thing to do. And that's really where the value for Easy Crypto and NZDD come from, is for Forex businesses, people looking to move money quickly and financially efficiently in and out. Um, the second one is swapping, right? So swapping, trading is a huge part of the crypto experience, uh, crypto experience right now. However, if you're in New Zealand, I've got my Bitcoin, I swap it into USDC, but the USDC price might move between the time you make your next trade. Now your stable coin is something that you have to pay capital gains or capital loss taxes on it. It's a really, really, non-obvious problem when you're starting out. It's something you don't really think about. And that's part of the reasons why we saw there'll be value for our customers here. The ability to trade and hopefully get this onto other platforms and other exchanges. Um, and people, New Zealanders to be able to trade in and out of stuff without having to incur, I think it's what, instead of it being two tra uh, tax transactions to being three, to simplify their experience. The third point, and this is, it is a controversial point. It is difficult to talk about is a lot of Web3 businesses aren't banked. There is difficulties in that space. There are There is friction there. Easy Crypto is lucky enough that we are able to get banked. And that's taken a long time. Easy Crypto has been in the market about seven, eight years at this point. And we've had to work on those relationships. We've had to build that trust every single day. So when the business is starting out, it's actually really difficult to get banked. And we see NZDD not as a long-term solution, but something that can just fill that bridge, right? That can help a business get to market, that can help them test their concept, help people innovate and evolve in this space while they do work on the bigger processes of developing their bank accounts, developing those relationships. Then the really interesting one that we kind of found out as part of that due diligence part we mentioned before is well, a bunch of US businesses were already thinking about uh, doing it in New Zealand. And we only found this out because I'd already filed a whole bunch of trademarks. And we kind of have talked about this and about like the need to compete against a business like that. They are large international businesses. If they want to do something, they're going to throw capital at it. They're going to throw resources at it. And they're not even going to notice, right? 
So what right does easy crypto have to compete against them? Well, we kind of flipped it on its head, right? This is a New Zealand digital dollar stablecoin. This should be run by a New Zealand company for New Zealanders. It shouldn't be headquartered out of Washington, DC or out of London or wherever. It actually should be built by Kiwis for Kiwis. Full disclosure though, I am recording this in Canberra, just putting that out there. Um, yeah, fifth point, we kind of already touched up really great synergies with our trading business, both for our internal, but also our external ones for our customers, for us, uh, for our large OTC clients as well, wanting the ability to hold positions, wanting to do more complex financial trading um, in a way that didn't implement an extra layer of complexity, which was the US dollar stable coins. And then, yeah, stable coins have a really great product right now. They're a really innovative, growing area and the market's ready to explode in our opinion. And we just wanted to get in on the ground floor. That was why we built it. And we can have a whole bunch of ideas about why we're doing something. But at the end of the day, rubber meets the road and we need to look at how people are using NZDD. So this is all stuff we've seen in the market. This isn't stuff that we kind of are doing ourselves. This is other people taking this product, running with it, making it their own. Uh, like anything in the crypto space, it, there is a level of decentralization. There's a level of uh, self-custody to this. Once this thing is out there, while we are the issuing company, we really can't control how people use it. The only limitation there is people's creativity. So we've already seen Web3 businesses start to use it instead of banking. Uh, the big one being to pay stuff, actually. So Paul alluded to it earlier. So I'm based in Australia and actually getting paid as an Australian, Australian dollars from New Zealand is surprisingly difficult. At the time, I thought it was easy, easier, just get paid in, I think it was Bitcoin. That turns out to be a complete headache when you have to unpick that for tax time. Not only do you have to pay an income tax, but then if you don't sell your paycheck as soon as it arrives, and I mean the second it arrives, turn it into fiat, well, then you're looking at secondary taxes related to capital gains and capital losses, depending on how it moves. And then furthermore, okay, well, if you didn't sell the whole paycheck and you get a second amount of pay come in, well, if that's at a different price, then that complex, makes everything more and more complex. So we've seen lots of people actually paying stuff in New Zealand dollar, uh, digital dollars, which was really, really exciting to see because that's such an important transaction. It's not necessarily a huge transaction, but it's an important one. It's how people put food on the table. It's how people pay their mortgages. We've definitely seen the Forex types transactions, um, mostly into US dollars. The one we're really wanting to target is Australian dollars, that Australian New Zealand bridge there. But yeah, definitely seeing a lot of people pick up. And this might just be because of how much US dollars already dominate the stablecoin market. But yeah, we're seeing more and more people going between New Zealand dollars and US dollars via the stablecoin. Payments, one of our favorite New Zealand crypto businesses, PIN, pay it now if you haven't heard of them, look them up. They are fantastic. Um, they've got a really good app that enables you to like use crypto every day. You can go in and pay at a store with New Zealand dollars. It's a really cool product. Would recommend checking it out. Next one is peer-to-peer -peer payments. Um, it's a little bit harder to kind of like understand the technicals of this because peer-to-peer -peer payments are inherently a transaction between one person to another person, right? You don't really get to see the who, what's, when, where, and why. But we've got actually a pretty good hypothesis. We've seen enough on-chain data that there's a decent amount of Genuine just buying and selling, be it, we don't know if it's marketplace transactions, but people are actually using this instead of cash to buy and sell from other people. So the next one is kind of touched up with the payroll thing, um, but yeah, people that are employed by overseas companies, well, those Forex issues that we talked about, well, them needing, so say Easy Crypto needed to acquire US dollars for something, well, that's really difficult. Well, it's just as difficult in the other direction. And then combine that with it being a really important transaction, but not necessarily a huge transaction, which is somebody's pay, right? That is a headache for lots of international companies. And we've seen them, some of them use NZDD to really simplify that process, make it really straightforward, and um, ultimately create a win-win situation for both the employer, but also the employee. 
we've seen lots and lots of crypto trading um, on the Easy Crypto site, on the Easy Crypto app, but also out in the wild in the DeFi space. People using it um, in a similar way that they'd use uh, US dollar stable coins, but all the benefits of it being a New Zealand dollar crypto stable coin. And then the last one's a really, really interesting one. It's the classic time in the market kind of thing, waiting for the right opportunities. We've seen people that have done really, really well on a particular trade and then cash out. They want a stable harbor that they can wait, that can bide their time. They can know that they're holding something that isn't going to change in value, isn't going to go up or down, it's solid. While they analyze, they wait, they time themselves and get ready for the next opportunity without needing to move the lose money, all that money fully off chain. Um, because that means they can't actually move that quickly when they want to move into another position. That position might only appear really quickly and only they might last for a very short period of time. And thus having something stable that they can pivot out of and into really, really quickly has provided a lot of value, especially to a lot of our high net worth individuals, people who do lots of professional trading, which has been, yeah, really, really interesting. So two more slides, then we're done. I'm going to get a drink of water because I need one at this point. Um, that was where we we're kind of at. But this product only launched in November. We've seen all of that stuff that we discussed since November. We're not planning on being in the market for another three months. We're planning on being here for the long term. So we're thinking this thing is going to grow. It is going to develop. It is going to get more of that network effect. And these are kind of the areas that we're hypothesizing that that might actually be in. We don't know. And ultimately, it'll be up to you guys watching today if this is something you take, if you use it in your day-to-day -day lives, where you see value in it. We don't get to dictate where it's going to go, right? It's something for the community um, to take and make what they want to be, right? So that being said, we've got some ideas. We think these are areas that we haven't really seen a huge amount in, but we think there could be a lot more in the future. Increase in bill payments, right? So we've seen a little bit of this, but we really think with stuff like smart contracts, programmable money, really highlighting the ability to pay bills. With a smart contract, you could set up a bill that people deposit whatever currency, whatever token they want into the smart contract. The other end, it spits out NZDD. So you can get paid in your preferred currency regardless of what they want to pay you in, simplifying the experience for both people. Forex market. So this is a little bit different to just crypto trading, but given the speed, given the frequency and the costs which you can trade out on chain versus off chain, we're hypothesizing that we're going to see a lot of people trading just currencies, not necessarily cryptos, but currencies on chain, moving out of US dollars into uh, what is it, pounds, into New Zealand dollars, into Australian dollars, all being able to do that from one centralized global marketplace. And we think NZDD, because of where New Zealand kind of sits in the Forex market currently, it's kind of seen as a bit of a bellwether. It definitely hits above its weight currently. We think NZDD is going to form a really, really important part of those Forex markets moving forward. Yielding and lending instruments. This is what we see a lot of banks currently doing with dollars, right, is interest bearing accounts on the counterpoint to that, ways that they're generating interest through lending it out. We're excited to see if somebody can spin something up like this for NZDD, a way to earn interest on the NZDD sitting in your account, the ability to loan it out, the ability to put that money to work. Um, and yeah, if anyone in the audience has got ideas about how we could do this, about uh, potential use cases, really interested to push this one um, and see what we can do. Next one we've seen again a little bit through Pin Pat now. Again, highly recommend you check them out. Fantastic guys running that company. Really can't speak highly enough of them. Uh, but payments and merchant acceptance, right? Ways of avoiding the Visa and MasterCard networks or avoiding other traditional like clunky things so that you can deliver payment for goods and services directly to the merchant and vice versa, right? That you can really facilitate that transaction as between you and me with no middlemen. That's something we're really excited about. Next one is more cross-border flows. We specifically want to target Australian cross-border flows. More than a million Kiwis live in New Zealand. 
I did not need another New Zealand well, great. Um, more than a million Kiwis live in Australia. A large proportion of them do send money still very frequently internationally between Australia and New Zealand. While it's kind of a bit niche on the global stage, within our region, it is one of the biggest and most important Forex markets there. And we really see this as something that we can disrupt. We've got, uh, we know the team uh, AUDD over in Australia, um, and we're really wanting to tie New Zealand digital dollars being the bridge between Australia and New Zealand financially. Last one, again, programmable money. Unlike cash that we currently have, this NZDD can interact with computers in a native way. It can do things because computers told it to do something. It can do things both in a centralized but also decentralized trustless way. You can say, when this person does X, I want to do Y. Okay, well, when this person provides this service to me and I can verify it, then the money will be released. You can look at doing um, a whole bunch of really, really complex transactions, really taking that smart contract idea and just combining it with regular old contracts from the real world and getting automated trustless executions of financial transactions. That's where we're hoping we'll go, but ultimately it isn't up to us. They're just some thoughts, really can to hear ideas. And to wrap up today's session, we thought we'd just do some questions just at the end here. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Patrick and Paul, for running through that. The amount of knowledge you both have is insane. So I'm super excited to dive into the questions because I know that the detail you've already been giving us uh, is, is testament to how hard you and the team are working on this uh, and how much you know. Uh, but I also like how you're asking everybody to give some new use cases um, because we were talking about it earlier and, and really this is a, a, a new invention uh, for the team here. And they're really trying to just ensure that they can create the best possible outcomes for New Zealanders. Like they said, solving an internal problem, but also trying to help everyone around them. So if you do have any ideas, uh, feel free to chuck them in the chat, email us, email uh, the team. We'll send you their email addresses after the event. Uh, but for now, let's jump into some questions. So some of the questions that uh, you have asked are a little bit uh, leaning on the financial advice side. So just a preface that the team uh, over at Money Hub and Easy Crypto cannot give financial advice. We can only talk to the product and services that are uh, offered here. Um, so we'll dive into the first question. Um, it is what factors could lead to the de-pegging of NZDD like we saw similar to the USDC last year? If it happens, what measures have been put in place to contain the risk? Paul, do you yeah, want to take that one? Do you want to take that? I'll do that one. So look, it's a great question. So um, just a little bit of history. I think it was in late 2021, early 2022, um, USDC had a, a DPEG because one of the US banks they were using Silvergate um, was in crisis and people were like, oh, I, I won't be able to get um, the fiat back. And so there was a, an oversupply. People were selling too much. And then what, what happened on the exchange market is that the price stopped being kind of one for one and moved down to sort of, I don't know, 99 point something cents or something to that effect. And with a, with a you know, a, a little voyage lower than that, I think. Um, and so the factors that drove that were um, on the secondary market and very clearly we need to divorce the secondary in the, in the primary market was just oversupply and not enough demand. And so the price fell on the secondary market. But if you were able to deal with the issuer of the USDC coin um, directly, you would still get one for one. And so that's why there was this kind of really interesting arbitrage happening behind the scenes where people were picking up USDC cheap and then selling it back to the issuer. And, um, and and that's one of the mechanisms that exists. We should be very clear that arbitrage is one of the mechanisms that exists to keep price parity. Um, in our model, if you if you deal directly with the issuing company, uh, NZDD, then it's always one for one. If you turn up with 100, we'll give you $100 back or 100 stable coins out. Uh, and so uh, what happens on the secondary market is outside of our control, but that's that's just how, how they operate at the moment. Yeah, and there's a lot of, um, I guess, 
a lot of trust that needs to be built up for um, the crypto space in general, um, but also every time a new product comes out, a lot of people uh, in the general audience are, are struggling to feel the legitimacy of these offerings. Um, we have seen the 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 whole world really take crypto uh, and and test it and have a look. You know, some countries accepting payments. We've had a whole bunch of new products and services come up over the past two years. Um, it's actually been around for quite a long time now. And so I feel like the, the trust is, is is building up there, but I guess everyone still has these doubts. And, and someone's asked here that, they believe that stable coins have a high degree of instability uh, and they believe that's demonstrated by the uh, failure of UST, the murky legitimacy mm -hmm. of USDT. And I guess it's just another question of how are you positioning into the DD to really be different and, and give New Zealanders and, and the world the, the trust that they um, need to give you for this product to succeed? Yeah, so look, I think we should, should be really clear that not all stable coins are built the same way. In the UST example was a, uh, I'll be polite and say an experiment. Um, there was a, a, in the market a very large lack of understanding about how it actually operated. It was pegged to a, an extremely volatile asset underneath and it was paying out sort of 20% uh, yield. You know, those, anytime you, you can't understand where the yield comes from, you should be, you should be quite concerned. Um, and, and then, you know, Effectively, the market moved against the the volatile asset, and the and the and the, the stablecoin vaporized, and and a lot of people got burnt in that, and and that was really unfortunate. But again, like it's like all all as, aspects of your investing in, in financial life. If if you're investing in something you don't really understand, you're taking more risk, and and a lot of people did that with the UST, and so you know my advice to you is if you're you you're going to look into using stable coins or any kind of crypto is do some research and look into it and see if you can understand how they actually operate and what they're structured and all that sort of stuff yeah i think that's a really good point and it's uh something that comes up probably once every single webinar is we always talk about how um here at Money Hub, we're big supporters of becoming educated on personal finance products. That's why we exist. And we partner uh, with, the, with the team here like Patrick and Paul to really showcase what's going on behind the scenes, allow people to ask questions and become more informed. So it's really, really good that everyone watching is, is here today and asking these questions. Because um, as Paul says, if you kind of don't really know what's going on, you, you need to do a bit more research and really understand it. Because at the end of the day, this is your hard earned money. And um, everybody on this call really wants to ensure that it's going to a, a great place and is, is really secure and safe. So doing all the research that you can is really beneficial. Um, yeah. The team here uh, obviously have a, we've walked through a few different things on the platform before in previous webinars, but uh, there's a question here discussing why would I use NZDD instead of NZD to transact? And are there any tax or cost benefits to swapping NZDD to and from other coins? Yeah, so it's, I'll jump in and take this one. So again, we're trying to replicate New Zealand dollars in a space that they don't really currently exist, which is on chain. So it really depends where you're trying to use your New Zealand digital dollars. If you're at the grocery store and there's a 15 year old teenager there asking casual card, probably not the right place to be using NZDD. But if you're on chain, if you're wanting to make a transaction in the crypto sphere involving crypto coins, or involving stuff that is internet based, that's a really good place to be using it. So it's really just about picking and choosing. Cash is still there. We're not trying to replace cash, but we're trying to complement it. We're trying to bring that experience to more places that you just previously couldn't otherwise use it there. Um, oh, also tax question, sorry, just reread that question. Um, so the main tax benefit is the uh, non-holding, holding of a non-volatile stable asset, right? So it just means that you're not going to have that first sort of risk exposure for something moving up and down in price. If you want to move out of position, you're wanting to move into something more stable. Um, so yeah, no risk. And part of that risk means you don't have to pay taxes on the change in price or get that tax return. It's stable, it's solid, it's one for one. It just simplifies the whole process. Um, so definitely from a tax resident in New Zealand standpoint, using NZDD makes everything a lot more simpler than it would using a US denominated stable coin. Cool. 
makes sense yeah and um as we talk about kind of the the different tax implications and we've, we've talked about like moving money around and things uh someone's asked a really interesting question which is has your team ever been in touch with mastercard or visa being able to spend nzdd like a normal debit card would be awesome so um i think previously we've talked about the crypto.com card um and how they have uh kind of it, they had a really big run up uh past couple of years a lot of new user adoption having partnerships with um spotify netflix things like that depending on the tier you of your card and things but um i guess have you guys explored that space is that something you might be looking to go into or what do we think yeah so we've definitely spoken to more mastercard than visa um we do know people from both teams and uh think yeah really really highly of it the big issue that we're kind of coming across to launch product because this is something that we want to launch is first of all do we do this for just nzdd or do we do this as an easy crypto thing for everything for bitcoin for ethereum uh running a card program is actually surprisingly difficult uh, there's a lot of nuance there's a lot of complexity behind the scenes it's the classic adage of something being simple means that there's a lot of difficult things you're not saying um and then the other kind of um problem that we want to work through is the first time you do anything it's always going to be the most expensive it's always going to be breaking new ground so we're really trying to do this in a way that is cost Effective, that is cost uh, beneficial to the customer. We don't want people paying huge additional fees just for the privilege of using NZDD. So it's about making sure that when we bring this product to market, it is the right product. It's a product that is worthy of the New Zealand consumer, not just a blatant cash grab or something that some overseas multinational is going to make a ton of money off at the cost of all of us here today. yeah and i think uh it's kind of in a similar vein uh, of these questions is people talking about the use case of nzdd as like kind of an investment so th there's quite a lot of questions and I'm, i know we can't really touch on the financial advice side but people are asking about the security stability uh maybe the increase of the value of it over long term like is it really like a a viable uh, investment instrument in any sense or is it more of that kind of safeguarded position as you were mentioning before where it's just kind of like holding some value like what's really the thoughts there so, so it's distinct system. yeah yeah i will so it is distinct from other crypto assets in in that um you're not speculating on its price going up or down right so it is designed to be stable so in its native form you know it's the same as holding dollars um, but there are ways within the crypto ecosystem and, you know, I saw one, one really informal question, you know, are we looking at compound or are they and all those sorts of things. And those are, those are kind of more advanced DeFi protocols. And there are ways that you can lend and, um, and borrow stable coins using that sort of stuff. And yeah, I mean, the answer is yes. We've just been, uh, largely waiting for a big network upgrade to go through the ethereum ecosystem which happened last week and then to see what happened to the deep ecosystem which is where we're, we're talking and then we'll, we'll you know, you know we'll, we'll make some decisions about how we take that forward and, and start looking at you know yield deriving instruments i guess using crypto um so that's that's part of the roadmap for us as well and then in, and just in terms of the security of it like it's it's um the software that we're using is um, is the same as stable coins that have been in existence for many, many years now. Uh, and so we've got a high degree of trust that the actual software of the token is robust and, you know, has passed muster. And we've added to that by having that audited by, you know, a, a real top notch um, smart contract auditor to make sure everything is, is working properly. And then, um, the other part of it is kind of like where crypto and, and traditional finance meets, you know, meets on the ground. And so we're, we're being audited by a, a big, big five, big four auditor. I'm not sure how you talk about those guys anymore uh, at the moment. And, and, you know, then we'll go through a process of doing attestations, which is, you know, um, displaying what's on chain and what's in the bank account on the website. So people can see in, in real time, what's, you know, that, that if there's $822,000 um, in the bank account, there should be 822,000 stable coins in supply. Yeah. yeah. 
is there anything you wanted to add to that one, Patrick? Yeah, so just on the essentially proof of reserves, that, um, really interesting area that we're kind of fleshing out at the moment. Don't hold us to any of this stuff because we're really wanting to design a solution, right? Because that, that this has been this historic audit kind of thing, but audits are huge pieces of work. They only happen once per year. They're kind of this moment in time. And the second an audit finishes, well, you don't know what's currently happening, right? So one of the ideas we're looking at with this automated attestation, I probably a more um, commonly used term is proof of reserves, is we're looking at ways that we can do yeah, real-time user-challenged um, or like at least user, the event is caused or created by the user. You want to know in that moment what's happening. Automated attestation reports using third parties that systems function independently of NZDD. So you have that real-time proof of reserves information so that you can do it when and wherever you see fit, right? That it's not this just this one and done kind of big monumental things. It's accountability 24-7, 365, every single moment that you could possibly want to engage with this product. Awesome. Thank you, that. There's um <clears throat> there's quite a, a lot of questions coming in. Uh, so I'm going to, we'll, we'll try and rapid fire through some of them because uh, we are approaching uh, the end of the initial hour, but the team has agreed to to stay on for a little bit longer and answer some of the questions. So we'll try and we'll try and get through as many as we can. So first one is, how does NZDD make money? Uh, off the interest of the assets under management. Perfect. So the more money that's in the bank account, the, the more money that business makes. Cool. And what happens if the what happens to the stable coins if NZDD goes out of business or bust? So the issue is the holders of the coin have a claim on the trust account, and there's a whole section of trust law in New Zealand that means that if you you've got that claim, you can get your assets back, uh, and then there would be a um, a process that would be run by uh, an independent party to make sure that that happened. Perfect. What percentage, uh, if you know the exact number, of NZDD is fully cash backed? 100%. 100%. And what proof does the market have that NZDD is backed by fiat? Sweet. So the big one is we're working on a full proper audit at the moment. Uh, again, these things actually take a huge, huge amount of time. So while we wanted this pre-launch, it's just because these things are like six month endeavors um, that has been a little bit delayed. The results, as soon as we have those results from that, we'll get it to market. Um, obviously, if any uh, large or sophisticated investors want to reach out, we're happy to provide other forms of proof if necessary. Um, but yeah, once we get through this big main audit, then we'll also look at implementing a, the tech system, that automated proof of reserves kind of process. Um, the other one as well, I think it's really important because we have really clearly identified that trust is such an important part of the, the equation here, right? Is that you've got to trust that this thing is worth $1. It's not going up or down in value, it's just worth $1. Um, is that is the support that Easy Crypto also gives this. Easy Crypto has staked its brand and reputation behind this project. Even if things aren't strictly letter of the law, you have it on good authority that Easy Crypto will make it right because if we didn't, that would affect our trading business. It is really important that this is something that we do right because it's what the New Zealand people deserve. Yeah. Um, no, I love it. Great, great answer. And to continue the rapid fire, we will ask two questions in one. So it's how successful has NZDD been since launch? Are the Kiwis like keen? Uh, and also how many New Zealand businesses currently accept uh, NZDD slash stablecoin kind of options? It's been very successful. So uh, on our platform, it's the third most swapped asset. Uh, so it's supplanted the US stablecoins on our platform. Uh, we have 822,000 uh, minted. And so we're pretty happy with progress in, in that regard. Um, and I can't remember the exact n a number of holders, individual wallets holding it, but it's 200, 300, something like that, Patrick, you might know. Um, and then in terms of where you can spend it, uh, so if you if you are 
looking at pay it now which is a what we would call a merchant services platform there's 360 vendors that you can spend the stable coin at uh, already in new zealand up and down the country wow awesome and it's only going to grow from there so that's very very exciting now we will jump into a slightly more complex question um, which says have you considered launching nzdd natively on a layer two blockchain like arbitrary um, yeah so we're two steps ahead of you there so when we launched it um we launched it on ethereum but it's also got contracts on polygon uh bsc base and i always get them confused um between arbitrum and avalanche um so i'll have to get back to you on that specific one but the reason we actually haven't started publicly pushing this yet is while it is out there and if any anyone that wants it just let us know we'll sort it out we'll make sure you can get some of the chain that you want um is actually the user experience it's really important that we did the user experience right and just purely from our ec experience chains are something that trips uh especially beginners up more often than not and so how can we offer nzdd on as many chains as possible we're not even just looking at uh evm so ethereum virtual machine chains uh chains that start with zero x for their addresses like stuff like Solana would love to list on. Um, it's how can we do that in a really intuitive, user-friendly way, in a way that people can move between chains, take their money where they want to have it in a cost-effective um, and, yeah, straightforward, essentially the Apple principle way, like how do we make that UI Apple UI? Awesome. I love the commitment to um, ensuring that the user experience is really solid um, and also just ensuring that New Zealanders are able to engage in a way that they are comfortable and they enjoy. Um, one of the uh, additional questions to back up a point we were talking about before around trust uh, really comes from the the bank that, uh, that you guys are working with. So someone has asked, which bank is the NZD used to purchase NZDD deposited with? Uh, what's the approximate interest rate earned? Who gets the interest? What if the interest rate fell to 0%? Yeah, so the bank is Kiwi Bank. Um, the interest rate moves around just like all banking, and you can see it. It's, you know, five point something, I think, uh, at the moment. Uh, if it starts falling to zero, then we need a lot more volume to make money. That's just how it works. And so that's why... And Patrick and I continue to work with partners and drive volume and institutional use cases and that sort of stuff. Yeah. Perfect. The other thing just to add to that is a large amount of the value for NZDD for easy crypto is actually being driven through the token in and of itself existing, right? A lot of the value yeah. is things that are accessible to retail investors, to institutional investors to facilitate Forex trades. There is genuine financial value in being able to lower our capital requirements being able to move quickly. So even in a zero interest rate environment, NZDD will still actually provide a significant amount of value to Easy Crypto, purely as Easy Crypto just being a customer. And that was one of the really important key aspects of it. We don't want this just to be uh, uh, something that just an excuse to put some money in the bank, but it actually needs to be a product that in and of itself drives value, drives use cases, and is something that we want to use. This is something Easy Crypto wanted to build first and foremost for itself. And that's only after the fact that we've decided to kind of push it out and just make it open source, make it accessible to everyone. So that if it drives value for us, why not also drive value for them? That's awesome. And I, I love the, the talk about the use cases. You spent a lot of time at the end of your presentation talking about it. And I think this is a really nice place to ask probably one final question, which is, can you walk us through what it looks like to be paid in <clears throat> New Zealand dollars in a New Zealand environment and then try to send your money overseas through the use of NZDD? And how does that kind of work? Sweet. So the easiest way at the moment, and the one I can speak the most to, but again, isn't the only way, because the idea is that this is just something out there, right? We're not gatekeepers in this. Easy Crypto isn't the sole party. This is like cash, right? You can use it in as many different ways as you want. The current way though that I can speak to is the one you're know, obviously most familiar with, it's EC. So say you wanted to convert your New Zealand dollar pay into NZDD automatically day in and day out. So what you do, jump onto the Easy Crypto website. You would set up an auto buy 
Uh, so an auto buy is we give you a essentially a little uh, deposit kind of description to put in your bank transfer. And then we also give you a bank account to send it to. You'd give those details to your employer when you get your pay, provided it's got that little snippet in the description, that pay will just flow over to our systems. And then we will automatically send out the equivalent amount of NZDD to the wallet address that you want. Uh, you won't have to do anything once it's set up, it will just run end to end automatically. Once you've got it on chain, the world is your oyster. You can do more complex things like set up smart contracts. You could check trade it into via Dex manually. You can set up a few automated methods to turn it into USDC or USDT or any other stable coin that you wanted. And then once it's there, um, you can either hold it in those stable coins or cash it out within those countries using their local systems. Um, but yeah, really the idea of getting the NZDD, NZD to NZDD section uh, we really want to make that as smoothless and as seamless as possible. Once you've set it up, once the money hits that account, it'll be automatically turned into NZDD and sent to your desired address. Amazing. Super clear, super knowledgeable. Thank you both for the presentation today and for all the questions that you've answered. Uh, I'll hand it over to both of you to say anything finally before we wrap up. Is there anything you want to share or remind the audience of? Um, biggest thing for me is that we're here, we've got a really big, strong focus at Easy Crypto and at NZDD about transparency, accountability, and accessibility. Uh, so yeah, mainly on that last point, if you want to get in contact with myself or any members of the Easy Crypto team, for NZD, it's info at nzdd.com. For Easy Crypto, for any of your questions about crypto, just in general, about Bitcoin, any of that stuff, it's help at easycrypto.com. And thank you very much for having me. Um, I really enjoyed this experience. Yeah, just to reiterate, thanks for, for uh, your time, everyone. Uh, again, you know, we know that our space is, is new and exciting, and we encourage you to just find out more and embrace um, the learning journey that we're all on in terms of investments and, and new technologies. Um, one one thing is clear is that digitization is coming, and we just see NZDD as another form of that. It's just digitizing the New Zealand dollar. And uh, we, we like you, have, have some views on where it's going to go, but it's going to be up to people like us to create that future, and that's an exciting place to be. Amazing. What, a, what an amazing wrap-up to an awesome event. So thank you both uh, again. Uh, we'll wave them off screen. And with that, uh, we will say goodbye to the Easy Crypto team uh, and NZDD um, presenters and so at the end of this uh we'll send out an email tomorrow with some some feedback if you could fill it out so that we can make our next event better that would be awesome and we'll also send through those email addresses that they mentioned so that if you have any questions or need any help you can get in touch with them one of the things that i really love about the team that we work with here is that they always always pride themselves on being accessible as they say and that is awesome for us kiwis because we love talking to real people so they will be real people answering your questions and you will get everything that you need sorted from them so thanks again for joining us today we hope you enjoyed it and we hope you learned something useful uh this recording will stay on youtube so that you can re-watch it at any time and with that we will end the stream thanks everybody have a great day <laughs>